Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Melis Güven. I'm the global lead for delivery systems with the social protection and protection and jobs um, global practice of the World Bank. Um, let me first highlight that we have simultaneous interpretation to Arabic, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and English during this event. So please click on the globe icon um, in the Zoom platform. It should be at the bottom of your screen um, to, to change the language so that you can follow the session in your preferred language. Okay, great. So um, it's my pleasure to be moderating this um, exciting event this morning. A warm welcome to our um, participants and huge thanks to our panelists for being with us today. Um, we have a fantastic panel actually, and we are really looking forward to hearing about the rich experience and to having an engaging and interactive session today. Now, to make, uh, make that happen, please put your questions in the chat after introducing yourself. I'd also like to note that this event is being recorded and the recording of this session will be available after this, this webinar. So uh, for our newcomers, a little bit of a background on this event series. PI Open House gathers global and, and country experts on strategic thinking around economic inclusion programming and innovations across countries. This is the, the second event in the series after the summer break. And today we will be discussing savings and how economic inclusion programs are supporting extremely poor and vulnerable populations to save. Um, the topic of this session is indeed quite important. Why? Because savings support resilience and opportunity by helping people manage their daily needs, build human capital, take up productive investments, and, and cope with household shocks. But despite progress in access to formal savings accounts and, and mobile money as uh, ways of saving, according to the, the Global um, Findex survey um, in 2021, 58% of um, adults in developing countries do not save. And those who do save often struggle to find secure and convenient ways to put their money aside. This then, of course, limits the ability of people to increase savings, undertake timely productive investments, and therefore increase their vulnerability to shocks. This is particularly true for women, who represent the vast majority of, of um, unbanked adults globally, and, and they face additional barriers to access as well. So then, how can economic inclusion programs help? I want to note that nearly 60% of um, economic inclusion programs facilitate access to saving services as part of their economic inclusion packages, often through community structures, and in some cases linking to formal financial uh, providers or digital payment platforms as well. And with women representing the main target beneficiary in most economic inclusion programs, there is a great potential to support women's economic empowerment through increased access to savings. And today we will learn more about how economic inclusion programs are facilitating access to savings for extremely poor and vulnerable people to support their way out of poverty. So, to introduce our panel, we are so lucky to have a great lineup of, of speakers to dive into this important topic with us today. Our first speaker is um, Desmond Dormetu, who is a production inclusion specialist in the Ghana Productive Safety Net Project. Welcome, Desmond. Our second panelist is uh, Susan Kondove. Susan is an operations manager at the Community Savings and Investment Promotion, COMPSIP of Malawi. Thanks for joining us, Susan, thanks. And our speaker, to, uh, our third speaker today is, is uh, Vidya Siriram, who is the Global Director of Village Savings and, and Loan Associations of Care USA. Very happy to have you with us today as well, Vidya. We are pleased to also have Sibyl Chidiak to serve as a discussant in our session, and Sybil is a senior program officer 
with the gender equality division um, at the Bill and G Melinda Gates Foundation. Thanks for joining the panel, Sybil. So, okay, um, let's get to the, the meat of the matter and get started with the presentations from the panel. Let me now turn to our first panelist, Desmond, who will talk to us about how the program in Ghana facilitates access to savings as part of the overall productive inclusion agenda and how the program works with beneficiaries to instill um, a culture of savings and influence their savings behavior. With that, over to you, Desmond. You have nine minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you to the team. I'm happy to be here to share our experiences with you, the story from Ghana. So yes, as rightly said, my name is Desmond Duametu, and uh, I work as a productive inclusion specialist leading in the implementation of the government's productive inclusion program under the Ghana Productive Safety Net Project. Um, so yes, we have been working on productive inclusion interventions for some time now. And I'd like, first of all, next slide, please, to share with you a background of the program, just so that you get the context right. Then I can get to the specifics regarding um, what we've been doing on our part to promote savings for beneficiary. Well, uh, it's a productive inclusion program, as I rightly said, it is part of the larger Ghana Productive Safety Net Project. And the program's objective is to support beneficiaries of the cash transfer program and the public waste program to establish an in, in enterprise activities and increase agriculture productivity, which ultimately would lead to guaranteed sustainable incomes for the houses. So following from objectives, we have two sub-components. One is uh, the complementary library and asset support scheme, which basically works on the enterprise leg of the project and would also have a sub-component that looks at establishing linkages for this household so that they can boost agricultural productivity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, I think I would want to dwell on the first subcomponent because that is where we do a lot of the work regarding savings. So this is a component, as I have indicated, that promotes enterprise, or let me call them investments for households. And um, for one to satisfactorily say that I have gone to the full meal, we go through these eight steps. So we say that the program um, involves various parts and this would have to be dealt with before a beneficiary can satisfactorily say that he or she has selected the program. Just to take you through it quickly, we set off by selecting communities and these communities necessarily ought to be LEAP or LIPW households. Then subsequently, the beneficiaries are selected from these communities Prior to that, the um, local government authorities are supported to uh, come up with a list of viable enterprise activities that would enable beneficiaries and reasonable incomes and on a regular basis. Subsequent to that, then we will take them through a rigorous regime of training, which is a precondition for the receipt of a cash, up, cash, a cash startup grant. So um, in all of this, we try to use this opportunities provided to work on savings. I'll be delving a bit into that. Now, post grant disbursement, the program provides for a one year duration of mentoring and coaching, which is intended to help beneficiaries to sustain their investments. And within this time, some of the activities that we focus on is helping them to perfect their acts in production, get them to also um, improve marketing and also help them in areas that we, we can work with them in ensuring that their investment are sustained. And here, one of the key areas that we, the, the mentoring focuses on is helping them in areas of financial literacy and uh, a key component of which is establishment of VSLEs and helping the VSLEs to go up to scale. Next slide, please. Having said that, let me look at what we have been doing. Next slide, please. Yeah, so now coming specifically to talk about savings. Well, in our effort to promote savings for beneficiaries, we have gone out there to consciously make sure this is reflected in various aspects of the implementation process as was shared earlier. Uh, for instance, during beneficiary selection, there's an incentive for every beneficiary to, I mean, get something started in, in terms of saving. So for instance, up right from community entry, beneficiaries are sensitized to know that it is only persons who have shown signs of initial savings are 
who, who, are give, who the, are the ones that are giving priority when it comes to selection. So long before you even get into do your targeting, you would find out that people have started saving, saving in order that they respond positively to that requirement. And also uh, we do a lot of work regarding the training. We have tried to infuse some of these elements in the training curricula. Our training, as I showed on the earlier slide, is broken into three different models. And uh, in the life skills and basic business management models, we take up topics using indigenous tools and then um, using um, activities that would allow beneficiary participation to put, drive home the point that there's the need for you to save and that it is only when you save that you can grow your investment. So you find this reflected in the various training manuals that we have. For instance, it has touches on activities such as how to come from a savings group, the various avenues for saving, and how to be able to distinguish between, between your capital, your working capital, and what comes to you as profit, and how to channel that, what, where to channel that profit to, so that you can uh, grow it and apply it back into the business so that you are able to grow the business. That, so we do a lot of that in that area. Also, when it comes to disbursements, we, are strategic in ensuring that the startup grants that are given to beneficiaries are delivered in two tranches. So that at least the first tranche is to get everybody started, but the second tranche is given out based on evidence of beneficiaries fulfilling certain key requirements, one of which is making sure that they are part of a village savings and loan association or are able to show evidence of saving. So you see that by so doing, beneficiaries have no choice that if they are interested in getting a second tranche, we are using this as an incentive to get them to get to save and get involved in saving. And in fact, during the uh, monitoring sessions, this the, the field officers who go out there to monitor are required to report on this. That is what lead me, leads me to the next point, that the, men, the coaches that go out to the communities to work go and lo go looking out for this and they report back to us in indicating who is participating in savings, who is not participating in savings, so that that informs the decision of whether the person is recommended for the subsequent tranche. Another area that is helping us to promote savings for beneficiaries is that we disperse our grants through an electronic payment platform. So they are giving smart cards. And these smart cards have wallets for saving. So you find situations where beneficiaries would go to the uh, point of sales vendor and require that, okay, I'd want to put this money on my um, wallet. And we provide them with enough education to know that this opportunity exists. And that is how we are able to achieve savings. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this next slide. Oh, who is managing? Okay. Um, Claudia, uh, can you put Claudia, up the yes, slide, slide, please? We don't see the slides anymore. Yeah. Sure, one minute. <clears throat> and Desmond, in the meantime, I wanted to remind you that you have um, about two, three minutes, please. Yes, I'm Thank almost running now, sure. Great. <clears throat> okay, so um, I touched on village savings and loans association. So in the design, we have consciously gone out to promote village, the concept of village savings and loans associations in the communities. And we're able to do that by ensuring that we initially do a mapping of existing opportunities that will allow beneficiaries to save. The program also leverages existing NGO capacities that exist. And we have also developed content that would allow the district or uh, uh, local government authorities to be able to go out there and help in establishing uh, VSLs and in ensuring that they will pay sustainably. Of course, we also carry out trainings and provide the, the, the VSLs with the opportunity of linking them to micro enterprise or existing financial institutions so that they can grow to scale. The other thing we've done in promoting savings is that we have also started introducing beneficiaries to the mobile money, <coughs> of mobile money. And here, beneficiaries, based on their own choice, are linked to mobile money service operators and their smart cards are linked to mobile money. And you know, because this program takes place mostly in remote areas, they found the mobile money option very, very, um, uh, um, they find it very, uh, <clears throat> sorry. They find the opportunity to provide the money by mobile money very convenient in the sense that that it allows them flexibility. They are able to assess their money in good time. And it, it also enables them to transact business. For instance, they're able to 
acquire inputs from external markets, they are able to make sales. We have examples of beneficiaries in very remote areas because of the power opportunity provided by mobile money, are able to reach out to markets, make sales, and then get their, get, get their payments made through the mobile money. That gives them comfort. And of course, we have also <clears throat> found out that there is easy access to their funds and they are comfortable with it, except that it comes to some challenges, which I'm sure I'll be able to respond to when it comes to the Q&A session. So in wrapping up, I'd like to also touch on what we have done with um, Ideas 42 in testing a behavioral, carrying out a behavioral pilot, which seeks to establish work, work on beneficial, beneficiary behavior relating, in relation to savings, and of course, also in sustaining their income generation activities. Here, we are working in one, 104 communities. They are supposed to be um, a pilot we are doing, and we expect that the results would be out by the end of this year. We programmed that by December, the end line will be carried out and that would, whatever results we have, we would try to put together and see how we can infuse that into the design of the next phase of the program. And so for the Ideas 42 pilot, we've started seeing initial signs of people getting accustomed to the habit of saving. We see that people are beneficiaries of persons who have been targeted for the pilot, have adopted multiple savings opportunities. People, uh, there's also a spillover effect that has been observed where because of what is going on in the sample communities, other beneficiaries and other community members are also picking some of these things up and are doing it on their own. We see that gradually as we grow in that direction, uh, there is a lot we can learn from it. And we promise this committee, co committee of practitioners that when the results are ready, we'll come and share with you. Um, in my conclusion, I'll say that yes, savings is very important for every pro productive inclusion or economic inclusion program. Next slide, please. And if we want to sustain investment, it is one of the things we must pay attention to. And uh, we also think that there is always an advantage in harnessing local capacity and local institutional support in inculcating and deepening savings culture and beneficiaries. Well, we also think that for VSLA, to grow, we need to link them with traditional banking or financing institutions, like in our case, rural banks. And we also think that there is also, in, and there, it's always good for you to give beneficiaries multiple um, sources of saving or multiple opportunities so that they can make their decisions. <clears throat> it is always, again, useful to explore partnership with NGOs because in our case, we acknowledge that we cannot do it all by ourselves. There is expertise and there's a world of knowledge in the NGO and CBO community. So we are leveraging that in the helping to promote savings for our participants. I think that for want of time, I would want to end it here and then probably take the other issues on during the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Desmond, for this um, excellent presentation. Indeed, very interesting insights from the experience in Ghana. Um, I really like the fact that uh, the program um, offers a package um, from different angles, including training on life skills and, and business development, um, and also uh, emphasizing in the training how important savings are. And I also like the uh, like very much like the uh, this feature on where there's a condition to be part of the the VSLAs to, to get the second uh, tranche of, of of support. Um, so um, this is great. Um, and so maybe um, as a follow up um, on your presentation, I have a, a quick question. Actually, you did mention. Um, your partnerships, uh, particularly with the with the NGOs uh, and, and the private sector. Um, could you perhaps elaborate a little bit on that? Um, you know, how has been the experience? What have been the, um, you know, uh, points to, to highlight, but also please share with us uh, the, the challenges as well. Could you take maybe a couple of minutes to um, share that experience? Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, um, you're right. We I touched on that. And for me, that has been one of the positives that we have been able to achieve, getting to work with the private sector and then civil society in getting this done. Because you see, ours is a state-run program and we don't have a limited resource base. So obviously we don't have enough, but we also re have not recognized that there are a lot of NGOs out there who also have this as a mandate. So 
we kind of see it as a win-win situation. We approached them as an indicator very early in the day. We carried out a mapping to find out on who exists where and what they were into. So for instance, we have um, uh, international NGOs like World Vision. We have Care in Ghana who are well-versed in this area. So rather than go and go to reinvent the wheel, we draw on their expertise and where they are not able to meet us. For instance, in the con or for the concept of VSLs, a major one is the box. Often you engage with them and they tell you that, okay, we can provide you with the capacity. We can provide you human resource. We can provide you with field offices, but we don't have the resources to be able to meet your requirement regarding the boxes. So we say, okay, as a project, we are able to take that up. So this is where I see these partnerships working well. And we have also worked well with rural banks in the sense that, um, well, these are more or less private entities in Ghana. Uh, they have their own boards and they have their own governance structures, but we have gotten them to appreciate that the program we are running holds a lot of opportunity for them. So you find now that some of the banks now go to the communities to mobilize the savings from this VSLs, so that they encourage them also to come and open accounts in the banks. And that automatically establishes a linkage between the rural bank and the VSL. And that, for me, holds a key for the future because naturally, once they start having accounts in the bank over time, they would be open to receiving support from the rural banks so that they can use that resource to go to scale. That is what I find like with most of the VSLs these days as we have. They are just content with their comfort zone. But I think if we want to grow this space and get beneficiaries to move on the path of growth and progress, I think the way to go is to help them to be linked to these existing institutions so that we can open them up to opportunity of getting some additional support. Thank you. Um, thank you um, so much, Desmond, um, for highlighting the importance of, of these uh, partnerships and, and, and how they work uh, to, to support beneficiaries. Um, so we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to you with, the, with questions uh, from the audience. Um, and just to remind the audience, please do put your questions in the, in the Q&A &A as we move forward with the session. Now, um, I would like to turn to our second panelist, uh, Susan. Susan will share the experience on how community savings and, and investment promotion under the Social Support for Resilient Livelihoods Program in Malawi has built the capacity of, of large numbers of uh, savings and, and loans groups and how the savings and loans groups were leveraged as a platform to provide additional services and how they were then made sustainable, inclusive, and, um, and adaptable. Over to you, uh, Susan. Uh, like Desmond, you also have nine minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Merinda. Uh, thank you. As already introduced, I'm Susan Kondowe, Operations Manager for Community Savings and Investment Promotion. This is a, a, prim, it's a cooperative, a union of cooperatives, an apex body for mad purpose cooperatives and responsible for implementation of the livelihood support subcomponent of the social support for resilient livelihoods project. Uh, just a background, next slide please. Yeah, uh, as already said, COMSIP is responsible for implementation of the livelihood support subcomponent, which is the, one of the main components of the main project, social support for resilient livelihood, and the, it targets 470,000 beneficiaries who are coming from the social protection programs of social cash transfer and the climate smart public works. The duration for the project is, 20, is five years. It's ending in December, 2025. And the aim of this particular project, the objective is to build resilience among the ultra poor in Malawi. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, since COPSIP has been implementing the savings and loans promotion, it has been doing this for quite a number of years. And the, the capacity building, looking at the scalability, how we've managed to build capacity of all these savings and loans groups and the leading to sustainability and inclusiveness. I would say there are quite a number of things that we've looked into and the main uh, area is the capacity building itself. How would you the capacity of the SLGs, that's the savings and loans groups. 
first of all, I'd say that the secret, the, 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 the genesis starts with the social marketing, where we are forming these particular uh, SLGs. The social marketing leads into safe selection. So the members are safe selected into the groups. And then he, the way we work, we work with in coordination with a lot of uh, government extension workers, mostly the community development department, which works where we work with the community development assistants and the case workers at grassroots level. These are the ones that are responsible for mobilization of the groups and then he, train them in group dynamics until they reach a point where the groups have been formed and are ready for trainings. So the trainings are also offered by the same extension workers in support with the community facilitators. The community facilitators are the local admitters that are selected within the groups and they are group members. That's the unique thing about our local facilitators. The community facilitators in COPSIP groups are members of the same savings and loans groups and they are chosen based on specific criteria that is given to the groups so that they identify someone who's got whose literacy levels are a bit high are able to understand some of the things because they work as a, an extension worker in the in place of the extension worker who may not be available during the time of operation apart from doing the trainings there we have um, district structures that we usually use since we are working in collaboration with government. It's a government project and we're working with the collab in collaboration with government ministries. These uh, extension workers at district level, we have um, supervisors that are able to provide technical support to the groups during the trainings, as well as during the mentoring and coaching. So these district structures are also assisted by the national level stakeholders that are also coming in providing the technical skills support. The other area is the utilization of the local meters who are used as PA trainers. We build the capacity of these local meters, the way we build the capacity of the extension workers in the trainings that we provide. So the, the community facilitators are also trained. They are empowered with the knowledge on how they can handle the groups, even in all the, the modules that we, we train the group members in. And as a result of that, they are used as peer trainers in the absence of the uh, extension workers. The other area is whereby, apart from working with these groups in the project, we lead, we also help these groups to work into becoming uh, formal groups. Uh, COMSIP being a cooperative union also promotes these groups into migrating, into graduating, into becoming cooperatives. They become multi-purpose cooperatives and they affiliate with COMSIP as a union. So in this particular area where we are formalizing these uh, SLGs into becoming business entities like cooperatives, we usually facilitate as union, we facilitate the formation of these multi-purpose groups, linking them to the Ministry of Trade, the cooperatives department in particular, which is responsible for training in cooperative member education, which is a training that is responsible for the registration of these SLGs into becoming cooperatives and also provide trainings in the cooperative management. This training is given to only those executive members of the corporate man, you know, cooperatives so that they are able to know how to manage the cooperative. This comes in in an easier way because the background starts in the way we operate with the groups under the project. And apart from that, these cooperatives of the, after they've been trained and like they, are, they, are, they are allowed to affiliate with the union, which is the COMSIP cooperative union for their sustainability as SRGs are formed. So far, we've had 897 affiliates from the projects that we've been working with and including the SSRLP project whereby we've just started this year in registering cooperatives and we've just made 50 out of the 250 which is our target for the SSRLP project. Next slide. Next slide. Maybe. Next slide. Yeah. And on the scalability, we also look at the SLGs as platforms for other services that need to be provided to the local communities. Since this project targets the ultra poor in the villages, the most ultra poor, those without labor, the, those that come in under the project, the social cash transfer beneficiaries, we also use these uh, platforms as the, these SLGs as platforms for delivery of other uh, interventions that may be required. 
For example, we have the formal and informal services that we have, that are provided through these SLGs. The SLGs, the members in the SLGs are able to mobilize savings. And so far in the SSRLP project, we've been able to mobilize over 700,000 US dollars in the past two years. And these savings, after they've been mobilized, they are also intermediated within the group members in through lending. So the members borrow from the same savings and use them and invest them in their businesses. However, in case there's excess, most of the times they may they always end up having excess funds that may not be borrowed or may not be lent to the members. These funds are deposited in the group savings account. So every savings and loans groups that COMSIC has has got a bank account where they deposit any excess funds. And these funds are withdrawn in case they are needed at the group level. Apart from that, members within the SLGs are also encouraged to open personal savings account. And we have so many members, the ATRA poor that are coming from this program that have been managed to open their individual savings account with the um, commercial banks. Groups are also linked to Comsib Limited. Comsib Limited is a subsidiary of Comsib and it's a microfinancing institution that was established with an aim to support members that are working in the projects with Comsib. Why this has been was established is because when we're linking these SLGs to other financial institutions, they couldn't manage to provide the collateral that is demanded by these uh, banks as well as microfinancing institutions. Therefore, the Comsib Limited was established to provide these services to these groups that are coming from the social protection program and are taken with the Atrapua, don't have assets that can be pro, that can be taken as collateral. So they are able to provide collateral free loans to these groups based on the relationship that we've had, that they have had with Comsib as a, an institution that is training them and working with them in the savings and loans groups. So the collateral free loans, they are able to get these loans at a very fair interest and their, their payment rate is 98% above, very good repayment rate, yet there is no collateral that is collected as they are getting these loans. And they are able to access some digitized products and even these loans are able are to are disbase through e-payments using the mobile money and even the repayments of the loans is done through the same process, through the mobile money of their choice as the members are servicing the loans. The other area is the market linkages. The market linkages whereby Comsip as a union, it comes in using the productive alliance approach, whereby Comsip comes in as a primary off taker to the groups. So Comsip promotes production of legumes and it promotes uh, production of other um, products that are done by group members through their group businesses. And the, usually Comsip comes in as a primary off taker. It buys these you know, products because mainly maybe the packaging is not all that value, all that impressive. And the value addition, it, has, it brings in the value addition at union level and distribute these products in the local um, uh, supermarkets where they can be sold. So Comsip is the first reliable market for the production of the legumes and other crops that the members are producing. Uh, on productivity, the other area is the productivity. The COMSI promotes productivity of, of productivity of these SLG members. Uh, how does it do that? It provides skills training, life skills training, technical skills training. This training, most of the times, because they are technical skills training, they are provided by business development service providers. So COMSIP works with the uh, other um, outsources, the business development service providers to do the trainings in the skills for these savings and the loans members. The, Susan, the M is, Susan, apologies. Hello. I will need you to wrap up in one minute, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah, so on the sustainability, we have four ways of sustainability. We have economic sustainability, where we are using the savings first approach and every earning they are getting, they need to earn to save something. And then on sharing, um, sharing principle, whereby they, we, we promote the promotion of uh, regarding a share as an asset. And then uh, out of the profits they earn in, in sharing these, uh, in, in lending these uh, shares, they are able to get about 40% and ration it back to the capital of the group. And we also promote savings linkages on the economic 
uh, or service linkages on economic sustainability. On social sustainability, as I already said, we promote the safe approach as local meters. And then on technical sustain sustainability, it's the mindset change transformation trainings that we know we normally provide, including the technical skills training. On ownership, we promote community and district structures use so that the communities are able to own the groups and support the groups in whatever they're doing. And even we promote group and individual visioning so that they are, as they are working in the savings and loans groups, they are able to have vision and work towards achieving the vision they had. We promote season engagement whereby we get feedback from the SLGs members to just to make sure that we are able to address the gaps that are there and satisfy them with the necessary, uh, necessary interventions that they need. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, on inclusiveness to mostly women and youths, we have come with, we've got uh, telemed interventions specifically made for the youth in that are participating in these SLGs. And uh, this is the youth challenge support whereby we are linking the youth to vocational skills where they're getting the skills and come up with projects implemented in their local communities where they are also able to employ several fellow youths in the projects they've had. These are mainly skills to do with the, 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 the life skills uh, projects, including the value chain production and processing. Next slide. Yeah, on adaptation lessons, we've heard, as I already indicated in the explanation, the local meters have helped a lot in the uh, sustainability of these groups in that the, even in the absence of the extension workers, the local meters, the community facilitators are the ones that are able to manage the, record, the group financial records as well as performance of the groups. The same applies to the business opportunities and the, we have had an experience whereby we've worked with both urban and rural communities, the urban poor and the rural, and the, the urban poor and the rural poor. We've seen the differences and we've seen the importance of uh, good literacy levels, high literacy levels, whereby we've seen a lot of uh, uh, urban poor groups performing very well because even the literacy levels, they're able to understand most of the trainings that we are providing them. Leveraging in technology, we've used digitized uh, products in working with them, as well as the uh, easing transactions for the urban poor, which has been very vital. And as well as affiliation of the groups to COMSIP as a union, which looks at them. COMSIP has got a national footprint in the country, and it supports these uh, groups even after the project life time. In conclusion, SLGs have been very key to promotion of economic empowerment among the vulnerable, especially women and youth, as it is in the SSRLP project. And they've been used as platforms for multitude interventions, including financial inclusion, as well as other services, market linkages, all that. And the lessons that have been drawn have been as through the primary, the pilot that we've had, they've been scaled up in the SSRLP project, whereby we are covering now all districts in the country. And other areas that maybe need to be considered could, be, could include the disaster risk awareness and how members can work on their groups or maybe on their group businesses as well as individual businesses while having in mind of the disaster risks that are taking place due to climate change that in the end erode their gains that they've had. And even the use of robust grievous redress mechanism as we are handling them. Thank you, that's all. Okay, um, thanks a lot, Susan. Sounds like you had your hands full with uh, the with, uh, COMSIP and this is um, so rich and, and important. Uh, and thanks for sharing that experience and, and insights with us. Um, I noted that um, the different levels of administrative structures are involved in the process, uh, which I think uh, contributes to, to success. Um, and um, and the role of community facilitators are are, are critical, um, and I really like uh, like the fact that these uh, savings group actually um, graduate to to becoming cooperatives, and and you do provide support uh, also uh, to them uh, to uh, as 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 business um, entities. And um, also the fact that um, you know there is support to link beneficiaries to financial services, but then 
um, the requirement of, of a collateral at that point that you um, noted and provide support. And there are questions from the audience on that. But just uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, my um, role as a moderator here, I also have a question for you. Um, so um, the um, uh, CONCEP has been implementing the, the social support for resilient livelihoods program for quite some time now, I understand, and it seems to have generated very important lessons as you, as you laid out. So what would you have done differently had you know what you know now at the outset of the program? Um, could you please uh, share your insights on this um, in, again, a couple of minutes, please, max three minutes, Susan, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. You are indeed right. Uh, we've been uh, implementing the livelihood uh, support for quite some time, and we've been uh, working with quite a number of SLGs. And uh, uh, there are quite a number of things that we've learned along the way that if we, we could have used them, this time we could have done it a different way so that we, we have um, much uh, better outcome as well as tangible impact. Uh, we've seen quite a number of things with experiences. For example, first one, I would say that uh, we've looked at, uh, we could have loved if we could have digitized most of our lessons and modules that are being delivered. So that after we've done the normal physical trainings, these digitized uh, modules are given to the group so that they do like refresher courses just to go through the lessons that they've ever had before and uh, refresh on some of the issues as the year the years pass by. Uh, the other issue is uh, just to high literacy levels among the among women, especially in the rural areas. We've seen that COMSIP would like would have loved if we could have introduced the other literacy functional classes at class at SLG level, so that these members that are not able to read and write should be able to re read and write and be able to comprehend most of the trainings, the modules that we provide with them. The other area is to focus on our attention in supporting the urban poor, who have been neglected quite a lot. We've just done this for last year for just a short period. And we've seen that with the high poverty levels in the urban areas, if you work with them with the literacy levels that they have, which are better off than the rural, there are some, the urban poor are another interesting group to work with and they easily grasp and progress in, in, in line with the capacity building that we provide. So we also intend to design tailor services that would specifically target the women themselves, whereby we'd be able to provide even grants to women in the SLGs because they are majority of our SLG membership, over 70%. And we could also focus on the youth skills. We've focused on the youth skills in the SSRP, but we've seen how interesting it is. We have a lot of school dropouts that are in the, among the poor. And if we provide them with the vocational skills and they're able to establish their own projects, we've seen them working and employing fellow youths in the rural areas within their communities. So that's another area that we focus most and like the way we are doing it currently. We'd also encourage the service linkages that have always been there, health, financial market, even veterinary services, because we promote acquisition of productive assets like livestock. We'd also come up with comprehensive building capacity of, of community facilitators, because we've seen how crucial they are and how key they are into sustaining the groups even after the project life. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Susan, for um, sharing those lessons learned over the implementation of this program. Um, and I think these are really important, the digitization, um, literacy, paying attention to literacy level, the balance between urban and, and rural, um, um, I guess uh, the, the linkages to, to services uh, and the capacity of, um, of um, community, um, uh, the, 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 those who facilitate these, um, these groups. So um, this is great. Um, and I'm sure uh, we are certainly taking notes uh, and I'm sure our um, audience is also taking notes um, you know, for, um, for other um, contexts and implementations uh, as, as relevant. Um, again, thanks so much. Um, so next, uh, I would like to turn to our third panelist, uh, Vidya Siram, to share CARE's experience on building and supporting um, savings groups across different settings 
and um, also reflect on how these are being integrated into government programs, especially economic inclusion programs, um, such as productive safety nets. So uh, the floor is, is yours, Vidya. I think you know by now that you have nine minutes as well. Thank you. Over to Nine you. minutes. Got it. Thank you, Melise. Um, thank you, organizers, for having me. So, um, you know, we've taken kind of a deep dive into two programs in two different countries. I want to take a step back and talk about you know, why are we talking about savings groups at all? What is the, the importance of working with and through savings groups? Um, if you would go to the next slide. So we've heard that there's ample evidence in how savings groups works and, and the impact that they have. Um, there is, there's almost immediate benefit in joining a savings group, we know that. But at CARE, we kind of wanted to go a little bit further and find out what are the accrued impacts over time? And what do we know about how being a member of a VSLA or savings groups helps you achieve uh, outcomes across a, a number of areas in, in your life as a woman or a girl. So we did a bit of a, a meta-analysis on uh, 10 of CARE's own programs that are uh, based on savings groups, and then about 75 external programs across partners, implementing partners that uh, do savings groups. And what we found is, yes, there's immediate um, immediate impact in being part of a savings group. So for every dollar invested by an organization like CARE, um, a typical VSLA participant will increase their income, um, you know, between $9 in the first year and $18 over five years. So there is a real critical need for savings groups to be part of economic inclusion programs because there's such a solid foundation for increasing uh, economic uh, independence, but also resilience over time. And uh, what we found is that it's not just about increasing income, it's also about how that woman is investing that income in, in the, uh, her productive activities, but also <clears throat> the resilience of her household. And what our analysis has shown us is that um, for, for every $250, let's say that we're investing in a program, uh, three kids go to school in, in that VSLA. And those are the attendant benefits that we really have to be cognizant about, right? So it's not just about savings. It's not just about investing in productive activities. It's about building the resilience of that household. And I think by now we're all sort of savings group converts. So I won't really dive into the details, but if you want, we'll share with you this analysis and evaluation that went into it. Uh, next slide, please. So the organizers wanted, to, wanted me to talk about, you know, how savings groups work across contexts. What are they? Uh, how do they differ? Um, Susan and Desmond have talked about savings groups in their context, but there are all kinds, right? There's Ruskas, uh, SACOs that work at the cooperative level. There's SHGs, which are um, popular in, in places like India. And uh, what, what CARE has formed, VSLAs. Um, they're, small groups of women that come together, usually self-selected, uh, and they're just a way for people to save together in London communities in places that have little access to formal finance or banks. Um, and they're a platform that really increase the efficiency of reaching women, particularly in rural settings, but as Susan said, increasingly in urban settings as well. Um, and they're an ideal platform for for information sharing, for training, and for service delivery, for government service delivery, because they are highly adaptable. So they're easy methodology to replicate. And we've uh, said at CARE that for every VSLA we form, one organically forms on its own, uh, a member just going and teaching another community member how to, how to form that group and run that group. So they're really adaptable. They work pretty much in every context. And they're an ideal platform, as I said, for service delivery. But that idea of a, women, a group of women coming together for an hour a week is a really efficient way to target and engage a community while also building financial stability. So CARES adapted this VSLA methodology in 30 years, and now we're adapting it in complex humanitarian settings. Uh, we have, we and every other implementing partner has really tried to unpack this methodology and plop it into conflict settings and settings where we work with refugees and IDPs. And there is a certain amount of ad adaptability of this model, but it requires some 
wrap it around service when you're engaging in complex emergency settings. So we've developed a methodology that shortens the cycle from a year to nine months that provides those wraparound services, the redress mechanisms, and then combines it with um, the cash and voucher assistance <clears throat> that come through the humanitarian setting and, and really builds that uh, solidarity in a place where people don't know each other, they don't have networks. And so there's a certain amount of matchmaking that happens. Um, but all that to say, VSLAs can basically work in every context. <clears throat> One thing I'll say though, is that um, the key to sustaining these programs and sustaining the impact of BSLAs in a woman's life is also considering the social norms that govern her access to finance, her use, her decision making within the household. And we'll say that um, layering interventions <clears throat> and using that group setting that provides trainings, access to services, including health messaging, nutrition messaging, are all things that are really effectively delivered through BSLAs. But for the first year of that group's existence, it's really important for them to, to coalesce and to build solidarity and, and build good financial health within that group. So uh, we don't want to crush the group with too many trainings right off the bat. Uh, we really need to be intentional about how we layer and sequence what we provide that group. And then also basing it on a really solid gender assessment so you understand <clears throat> what are the internal social dynamics that govern that group, that govern uh, their engagement in the community and their broader ecosystem and using that to tailor support that speaks to those dynamics. Um, that is really important. And I'll keep driving this point home, uh, how critical social norms are to achieving gains over time. And then the limitations of not addressing that um, in terms of sustained impact. Um, so while joining a savings group has almost immediate impact, uh, sustaining change and creating that deep impact relies on shifting norms, the household community, and market level. This is something that we have to be cognizant of. This is, it's not just that woman in her household and in her community. She is a market player. And for that market to be gender sensitive is very important for her to be able to be economically included. But norms change is hard. It's expensive. It's tricky if it's not done intentionally. But it is often the thing that will sustain health and economic viability of group members. Um, can we go to the next slide? All right. Um, I, I know Susan and Desmond have talked a little bit about targeting, but I saw in the chat there were quite a few questions about that. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, and I know that a, a lot of the World Bank programs are targeting poor, extreme poor, vulnerable, marginalized people. It's done deliberately and with intentionalities. And with VSLAs though, the principle is that groups self-select their members, meaning that care provides the platform and the training, but the groups are often your neighbors, family members, your friends. And there, that does lend itself sometimes to exclusion of the extreme poor or marginalized. So poverty targeting is very important. Uh, going beyond that self-selection to other uh, address other vulnerability cr criteria around age, disability, marginalization, and ensuring that the most vulnerable are supported is really critical. So uh, often it starts at the design uh, to make sure that one, you understand the complexity of social norms and gender dynamics in that community, and then developing selection tools uh, that are inclusive and ensure that the key players, the field facilitators, the program staff, the partners, all understand inclusivity and uh, that the most vulnerable are encouraged to join. So this is something that we do in complex humanitarian settings as well, is while we're giving that cash transfer out, socializing with the broader community, the importance of savings, the importance of financial stability in terms of building resilience, and then offering the SLAs as a platform to join uh, regardless of, of uh, social status. <clears throat> but once they joined, it's up to the facilitators to ensure that the specific needs of uh, participants are addressed. So uh, on the right here, you'll see a, a theory of change uh, from a program, a productive safety net program that we implement in Ethiopia. And the, the point I wanna drive home is 
in that very first box you see we're talking about basis and this is cares approach to addressing social norms right off the bat bases are vsla's with mo both members of the household male and female so you're starting savings right from the beginning understanding the importance of that uh, at the household level and then you're tailoring support based on the financial needs and capacities of that household and the member. And then beyond that, tailoring support aligned with their own ambitions. Not everybody wants to be a farmer, so designing off-farm pathways, employment pathways, and crop and livestock pathways. But number three, and very, very important, is creating that enabling environment. So social norms doesn't just happen at the household level. It happens at the market level, at the ecosystem level. And unless those three things come together, there are limitations to how uh, economically included a, a person is, despite the best intentions of the program, and how far she herself can take um, her own economic growth. So uh, next slide, please. I think I'm running out of time. Um, as Melise uh, alluded, one of the things that CARE is doing is we've formed VSLAs for 30 years in 62 countries, and we're great at it, we've learned a lot, but there is a need now for us to sort of spin off our own role and support other partners, local partners, but also government partners to really embed VSLAs as part of their social protection, financial inclusion programs. <clears throat> there are 20, 22 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa alone that have made stated ambitions to work with the SLAs in their social protection and financial inclusion programs. But uh, taking that ambition into actual program design and then implementation is a different thing. And doing that with intentionality and with gender at the core is a much different thing. And that is where CARE comes in. So um, there are limits to what CARE alone can achieve in that ecosystem if it's not supportive, but in places like Cote d'Ivoire, Uganda, and Rwanda, uh, we're working with the governments of those countries to, to align their budgets where there are stated commitments and projects that are being designed, to align their budgets, design their programs with intentionality to target women in DSLAs, and to address their specific constraints um, to their long-term economic viability and sustainability. So in the way that Susan said, you know, they're working with Comsip as a path to sustaining that program beyond the life of just the one program. That's the approach, right? Identifying the right partners in country to take the, take the program further than Carolyn can or beyond the life of the government program. So <clears throat> in countries where we have a deeper and longer term engagement with government, as in Uganda, um, we and to be very clear, this is a 30 year trajectory. This isn't, you know, a two year thing. We've been working with government, bringing them along for literally 30 years. And now we're at the point where, with the support of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Civil specifically, um, we're at a point where we're being invited to support government in designing their bilateral investments and where we can start to tackle some of those systemic barriers to the meaningful inclusion of women. So it's one thing to have an ambition to reach 30% of women, but then targeting and really making sure that your staff is aware of how to do that at a government level. You have the right project staff to be able to do it. Um, that requires careful, thoughtful design. Um, and then doing things like making sure that you're channeling funds. If you have an ambition to do cash transfer programs, channeling that not just to the head of the household, but to the woman in the VSLA. That takes deliberate targeting and thoughtful project design. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up here. I know I'm uh, just, a, just one more minute. So uh, what I'm trying to show here is that this pathway to get from engaging governments in conversation around the importance of including VSLAs in their programs to actually doing the design with the programs is, is a trajectory. It's not a straight and narrow line. Um, it's not linear at all. So on one end, and I wanted to give three different examples of how this will work, right? So on one end, we have Cote d'Ivoire. 
They have stated ambitions to work with the SLEs in their financial inclusion and social protection programs. We have MOUs with the Ministry of Gender, right? These are all really critical first steps, um, but we got to go beyond that. And, and so we're organizing uh, advocacy workshops with the stakeholders in country, specifically around the cocoa value chain, because there are a lot of players in that space and a lot of VSLAs being formed in that space. But getting uh, building on the momentum we have, the entry points we have, but then also driving consensus on how we work with groups um, based on their own express needs. That's another thing, is that we can't always assume that women want access to formal finance. Maybe they want access to smaller sum loans. Maybe they are perfectly fine getting loans from their VSLAs, but really understanding where they're coming from is important as a, a preliminary step. <clears throat> And then creating that enabling environment that brings all those various actors together is a, a critical step. Um, and then in the case of uh, Rwanda, we have uh, a ministry that we are working with, Minikopin. Um, but delivery through those government structures is can be a challenge. And government officials have limited time. You have to make your case, make it strong, and really add value. And sometimes bring project funding to the table so that you can really show and demonstrate the value of working with and through VSLAs. And oftentimes, the best way to do this is to succumb staff um, to the government office so that we can really have a hand-in-hand -hand relationship and explore how that engagement can work over time. And then we have the example of Uganda on the other side. Uh, we still have work to do, but we've gotten to a point where We've developed a regulatory framework that has been adopted by government and care staff are effectively informing the design of uh, two very large programs, one through the Ministry of Finance, one through the Ministry of Gender, EFED and World Bank, World Bank funded respectively. And we have funded commitments and now our job is to help them design, test, pilot the things that can be scaled through those programs. Um, so let me, let me stop there and then you can tell me if there's questions, follow up. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Vidya, for um, sharing this, um, you know, trajectory and experience over over 30 years. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, the points that you made, particularly on um, this is not only about savings and income, but also about uh, improving resilience is, is, is very important. Um, and the points on addressing social norms, particularly related to gender, for these programs to, to be um, successful is, is uh, very well noted. Um, it was very interesting to, to hear about the adaptability um, of, uh, of these programs to humanitarian uh, settings with some uh, tweaks and, and adjustments is, is um, also um, quite, um, quite interesting. Um, uh, so uh, obviously um, taking a uh, stock of, of household needs and responding to those needs and uh, also packaging this uh, perhaps with economically viable and, and uh, resilient uh, um, livelihood portfolios. So those are all very um, interesting. Um, so you, I have a question and, and you touched upon this a little bit, but then maybe you can elaborate for us uh, a, a bit further. Um, so, um, um, so as said, saving groups are, are used as uh, platforms to provide additional support su such as coaching or, or market links. And um, uh, can you please share with us uh, some of the prerequisites or key considerations for economic inclusion programs that are trying to leverage savings groups for the delivery of other components? Thank you. Meaning beyond the financial? Mm -hmm. Yes, perhaps. Yes. Look, I think the prerequisites are, are context specific, right? So it depends on, are you working in an urban environment? Are you working with highly marginalized people? There is no one-stop shop for this. Um, I think BSLAs are incredibly adaptable, right? They will work anywhere, but it, to ensure the viability of that group beyond one cycle, uh, to me, one cycle is not success. The, the, the group staying together for multiple cycles is success. And the key to that is really understanding the norms of that group. So I'll keep going back to this. So 
Are they majority mothers? Do they need nutrition training? Uh, do they need support to, for market access? Understanding that and tailoring support based on that context and that assessment of, of what's happening in that group is critical to developing a program that is sustainable and that can be sustained beyond the life of that project. Um, and then the other thing is really engaging uh, market players. It doesn't just have to be the INGO rolling out this program. One of the things we're really trying to do is to bring the private sector to the VSLA. So where there are some mobility cons uh, constraints, for example, there are private sector partners that could bring their processing facility closer to the VSLA. That is a near-term uh, thing that we can do that has long-term sustainable impact. So it really just does depend on the context, but also understanding the motivations and the ambitions of those members is really critical to sustained and economic growth of those members. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so context-specific understanding motivations, as well as engaging with other players, including the, the, the private sector. Those are the three main points that I noted. Thank you so much, uh, Vidya. So um, now I would like to turn to our discussant, um, Sybil. Um, Sybil, can you share with us your um, reflections on some of the main themes emerging uh, from the from today's presentations, please. Uh, you have six minutes uh, to share those reflections. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Melise, and and thank you um, to all the PEI organizers for inviting me as a discussant to, on this panel. As a longtime implementer and innovator of savings groups. Um, multi-sectoral women's economic empowerment programming and demand as well as supply side financial inclusion efforts. I couldn't feel more comfortable on this panel and contributing uh, to this global discussion. So thank you to the partners on this call who are all committed to learning and implementing economic inclusion in a more sustainable manner. And the presentations provided by Desmond, Susan and Vidya have been helpful in, in what has been happening, uh, understanding what has been happening across the, the African continent. Um, I've been asked to comment on in three kind of particular areas. One, really bringing out the main themes that we've heard across these presentations, um, touching on um, sustainability, scalability, inclusivity, and then really um, kind of, uh, you know, kind of grounding us on how this all fits with this global agenda, what we're hearing about um, in the global agenda and comparing it to um, what we've learned today and what we're, we're seeing on the ground. Um, in terms of main themes, I think, you know, we've heard that savings groups and, and village savings and loans associations, VSLAs, um, SLAs, SLGs have figured really prominently in livelihoods programming. I think we can't um, deny that. It's, it's a strong base uh, that has been recognized and has been plugged into numerous livelihood programs that are being implemented at national scale um, with the, within public sector and of course um, funded uh, through World Bank operations. Um, it provides uh, you know, one, one of the many financial instruments that women and, and group members will need. Um, and as we heard, it, it's really about fostering economic independence. Resilience is quite key. We learned this during COVID, as well as um, fostering the ability to start, um, expand, or continue livelihoods. Um, it also has intergenerational outcomes um, at the household level. Um, we can talk about agency and voice that all of a sudden women um, are able to have within their household that will translate to their daughters, that will translate to their sons and how they treat women. Um, and also looking at education levels that can be attained by all children within the household that has greatly improved. Um, we also heard that really groups that function, they follow a methodology. Um, it consists of basic principles um, and I think this is quite important. Um, we've seen programs that have come up and just uh, look at working with um, social groups or lively groups as they are, but without that structure, um, those groups aren't sustained. They are there for a project, and once that project ends, they, uh, you know, they disband. Um, so these principles of self-selection, 
setting up a governance body, setting rules, guiding weekly meetings, et cetera, is quite important. Um, we also heard that linkages to financial service providers, as well as public sector, um, you know, other initiative schemes, programs is quite important. And I'll say more about this in a moment because it touches on the sustainability, scalability aspects, but just flagging that this was a dominant theme in all the presentations we heard today. And then scale happening through public sector programs, as, as well as building off of the work um, so scale is happening, you know, building um, off of the, the public sector programs, but also work done by community based organizations and INGOs in various countries, um, which has allowed for partnerships to occur in communities with existing groups. So there isn't necessarily a need to continuously form new groups because there are groups um, where these programs are being implemented. Um, I think one of the things I heard, uh, maybe not so explicit, um, but there's multiple member memberships going on. You have individuals who are part of a savings groups who are also member in a cooperative or a producer group. Um, we also heard about digital financial services, including you know, mobile money. And this entry of this service is, for women especially is done through the group platform. This is when they have that first opportunity to interact with the digital uh, interface, a digital tool for learning, um, for financial um, service transactions. Um, but this is done in that safe space that occurs within the group. And then really um, another aspect uh, that we heard is, you know, something that touches on the local regulatory laws and what we're seeing is their aggregation levels that are being explored. So you have groups federating, join, um, ha developing an apex or even um, um, registering as a cooperative, um, growing and registering as a cooperative. So many programs in countries are talking about ensuring groups are, are registered according to the local law. Um, so it, it could be a SACO or cooperative or even an NGO. Um, and, and in Uganda, we are seeing the regulatory uh, provisions accommodate for self-help groups, which are groups um, um, that, that take any form um, that are uh, constructed on, informally. So really this is taking them to higher level platforms to be able to receive public sector support or have the recognition necessary for linkages to the private sector. I think this is a very important piece that we have to recognize that governments are moving towards. Um, so in, in their um, appetite and their now visibility of these groups are saying something needs to be done with these groups so we can do more, so we can channel more resources to these groups. And so that other actors, not just us, can engage with these groups within a legal framework. Um, and in some countries like Kenya, this allows for better financial intermediation. So between the members and the groups or and, and with specialized um, banks like cooperative banks that have been set up to lend specifically to these types of entities. Now, in terms of sustainability and scalability, um, I think definitely what we're hearing, these groups are, are a platform to reach women, especially in the rural areas, as well as um, um, not only for financial um, services you know, at their doorstep, but it's a way to work on delivering key basic trainings, as well as start to address some key normative issues. So when women join groups, some practices start to change and women start to gain agency over their resources and key decisions at the household, simply because of their ability to contribute financially to their households. Um, and these groups serve a purpose, but I think we have to recognize that they may not be the right platform for linkages that women need to further develop their enterprise growth. So again, remember, we're seeing a lot of these savings groups within livelihoods programs. Livelihoods programs are really about job creation, enterprise path or employment path. Um, so when we're talking about enterprise growth, it's not necessarily the collective that is an enterprise. So I think we have to be very clear about what these platforms serve and, and how they are useful in sort of like a graduation approach, um, which is really looking at pulling out women who are ready to um, grow their small uh, enterprise, micro enterprise into a medium enterprise um, who are ready to enter the workforce in any um, particular way. So some linkages make sense at the group level and some make sense at the individual level. And being able to identify and support the women, I think is a key aspect that we, we should you know, be um, 
looking at, and, and this is, touches on a number of programs that are looking at working with women in groups, but then looking at how they um, can pull those women out of those groups and really work with them on an individual basis. So then the mentoring, the coaching, the trainings that women receive or group members receive will start to change and need to become more tailored and specialized to their specific needs and to the sectors to which they're engaging in. Um, I think beyond accessibility issues, there's another big elephant in the room in terms of um, those um, um, groups and individuals who are looking for financial intermediation, and it's around the terms of borrowing, um, and, and they should be ones that um, entrepreneurs can assume. So often access to capital at an affordable rate is what prevents women from growing their livelihood activities. So they may know of a, a credit product, a loan product that is being offered. And there's, of course, many other barriers that can prevent them from actually walking um, into that financial institution's door. But once they're in, you know, the loan size, is it appropriate for the needs of that specific entrepreneur? Um, and this, I think, can only be addressed if we look at the supply side um, challenges and start, start really looking at um, how do we address them. So part of it touches on this need for more data from savings group members and women in general to be able to offer appropriate credit products and terms. And on the other end is a direct matter on the supply side that needs to be addressed, really bringing down the cost of capital, address the interest rates and Forex issues. The cost of borrowing for a financial institution is high. That's why you see them um, lending to their customers, their clients at a high rate. Um, they so have Sibyl, to transfer. May I that, ask that you to wrap yeah. up, please? Thank you. Yeah, so I do think DFIs and donors have a role to play here and complement um, to some of these large scale um, efforts, these economic inclusion programs. This is where um, we, we, we need to, um, you know, oftentimes we talk about better coordination and breaking down the silos that we often work with. Um, and I think this is where we can start to look at how do we better coordinate efforts so that we can look at some of the supply side issues as well as the demand side issues. Um, and of course, I have more to say, but I'll, I'll pause because of time and maybe through questions, I can address some, some more um, of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, um, Sybil, um, for, for sharing these, these reflections. And uh, with this, I would like to officially start the, the Q&A session. And I actually have a question and I'd like to address that to you, Sybil. Uh, so the question is, uh, rotating savings and, and credit associations are becoming more reliable than banks. How can such associations uh, be empowered? Kindly keep it uh, short, please, if, uh, if you can take that question, uh, because we don't have a whole lot of time for Q&A and, and have other questions uh, in the lineup. Thank you. Over yeah. to you, Sybil. Yes, I do think one way is, is really becoming more digitally connected um, and, and looking at ways of driving better data within the groups um, and their members so that it, not only the group can facilitate linkages that are necessary with market actors, um, in the agricultural space, in the, um, the traditional market space, retail, um, but also with financial institutions. So I think groups having better um, handle of their data um, and, and really kind of upscaling um, their operations um, as a group, but also for individuals so that individuals can also go out and, and seek um, the services and products that they need from the market. I think that's one um, major aspect. Um, and I agree, I think groups are, are becoming more reliable in some contexts. Um, you know, we see government, you know, coming to the realization of this and funneling more resources to um, groups that are registered, um, you know, through whatever regulatory laws and then um, making sure that they are um, channeling those resources directly to them. So I do think that they're, they are becoming more reliable than, than banks, um, but they still have limits. Um, and so this is why there needs to be um, work done on the group side so that they are ready to engage with the private sector. And then work on the regulatory side, I think. Um, and there is no one solution. So what we're seeing in Uganda with the recognition in the tier four microfinance act of 2016 of SHGs is, you know, it's one of a kind. It's not something that we see in other um, countries. Other countries do have provisions for SACOs and cooperatives, but not for self-help groups in particular. So that's definitely a space to watch. 
Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sibyl. So I have uh, a couple of uh, questions to Susan. Uh, Susan, the first one is how to mitigate the risk of a default in, in a collateral free loan provided by, by Compsib. And uh, are there any specific interventions you have found effective um, at helping you save and invest? Uh, please do not take more than a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, over to you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Uh, yeah, of course, when you look at uh, giving out loans to groups without getting any collateral, there are quite a number of risks that are there that are encountered in that. But when you look at this uh, particular specific uh, target group, this is a group that has been working with the COMSIP through the project for maybe some four, three, four, five years. And uh, based on the relationship that we've had, and this is the group that has also affiliated to the union. So COMSIP provides loans to these groups, only those groups that are working with concept in the project. It doesn't go outside its mandate. So it only targets those groups that are within uh, affiliation to concept union. So we depend on the uh, group collateral and the, the relationship we've built in working with them. Remember they are coming from the social protection group program and where they are regarded as those that can never be uh, targeted for lending or maybe credit facilities from the microfinancing institution. So they trust, we depend on the trust that we, they've built, we've built between us and the SLGs themselves. So the risks are very less because we are only targeting those that we've been working with for the previous years. So there is that relationship between COMSIV and the groups. Uh, regarding on the second question, regarding specific interventions for the youths, yes, like in the SSRLP project, we have specific interventions that are targeting the youth. Um, in these SLGs, we're working with the youths that are in the households that are targeted for the social protection program. And these households are the ones that are participating in the savings and loans groups. So the interventions that we have, are the ones I was talking of whereby we have specifically uh, uh, linkage to vocational schools for these school dropouts. So the trainings are normally done in such a way that it's a, it takes into account the literacy levels of these school dropouts. So the training is done, uh, it's a hands-on training whereby they're learning, they're learning from master crafts within their communities. And the, uh, after they've done the trainings and they're done with the, they've graduated from the six months, it's mainly six months, they've graduated from the trainings. They are given a startup capital in form of equipment that they can use. If it's tailoring, they are given a, a, a tailoring, a, a sewing machine. If it's welding, they are given the two box for the welding. Those that are into uh, maybe barber shops and the like, they are given the equipment in line with the course that they've undergone. So the interventions are specifically done for the youth and we intend, we are doing the same with, the, with women in the SLGs. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, um, Susan. Uh, so the next question goes to uh, Vidya. Uh, so the question is um, about how to uh, further um, link to other methods of savings and other financial services, Vidya, uh, including uh, digital savings and how to ensure in doing so extremely poor uh, and vulnerable group, uh, groups such as women are not left out. Over to you. Oh, well, I'm really glad you asked that question specifically about um, digital. So um, we've done some work on this to really figure out like what is it that converts uh, women's access, use, uptake of digital financial services. Uh, we did a study in Uganda a few years ago that really helped us understand like it isn't just about providing a tailored product, a bank product, but it is about the support that she gets to be able to, well, one, get a phone, but then <clears throat> the norms that govern the use of that phone. So addressing household dynamics, right? As I keep going back to, um, it, we do see often people handing out phones 
and expecting that that is going to be a solution, a silver bullet to helping women get online. It's not. Sometimes it leads to unintended consequences. That phone needs to be accompanied with normative support, peer-to-peer uh, -peer support. So it, not all women have uh, digital literacy. I don't really have digital literacy. I hand it to my nine-year-old to help me help get, get, get on my own services. It's no different for a woman in a VSLA, right? Having maybe the adolescent member of that household or um, a trainer, the CBT, be that peer-to-peer -peer support, someone she support, is, trusts uh, to get her online. <clears throat> and then providing sort of those tailored products that work for her. So this goes back to you know, my core point, which is really understanding what it is she needs and not assuming that she wants access to a formal bank account. Maybe she wants a $10 loan. Understanding that is kind of core to providing the, the content and the tools and the support that she needs. Um, and then linking her to those services. There are a vast number of service providers who actually want to work with the SLAs. They just don't know how. And so serving as that intermediary is a core function for organizations like CARE. But really sitting down with her and understanding what is it that you want what are your constraints? <clears throat> Sorry, I am losing my voice during this call. Um, and what can we do to support your own ambitions and entrepreneurial ambitions, right? To Sybil's point, it isn't just about, you know, getting access to an account. It's what are the terms of that borrowing? What are the rates for mobile money? Helping bring that down is really core to helping her get access digitally or otherwise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vidya, for answering um, that uh, question from the from the audience. It's it's uh, really an important one, and, and thanks for response. So, um, there are a couple of questions for Desmond. Um, Desmond, the question is uh, for you to elaborate more on um, how uh, how you work uh, to increase uh, financial literacy. And also uh, the, the second question is regarding the, the size of the grant, grant that is uh, provided. Please take only two minutes. Uh, we're gonna have to close the event uh, very soon. Thank you. That's okay, yes. Yeah. So, so for the, let me start with the size of the grant. I think uh, what we have provided for in the design is that the grant ceiling is the highest amount each beneficiary can get. It's um, the, the CD equivalent of $250, so that's the grant ceiling. So what this is uh, um, a beneficiary can get up to $250 CD equivalent, depending on what the investment plan says. So that is, is with, and these investment plans are normally prepared after the training and it's informed by what the beneficiary needs to get the household enterprise activity started. Now, um, we're regarding the financial um, literacy, yes. Like I said, we have built that into our training content. So that um, we, for instance, use um, community facilitators. We use social welfare officers at assemblies to deliver the training. And it goes beyond even the training, beyond the four days training in the areas related to financial literacy. A lot of this happens during the post-training stage, during the mentoring stage. And these people go to the communities and the facilitators go to the communities to do follow-ons on what the beneficiaries have been taught to ensure that they are practicing what they have learned or that they are infusing some of these things into, the, um, um, into their performances. I, they are infusing it into the enterprise activity they are carrying out. And they have clear reporting requirements on this so that whether it is that the beneficiary is found lacking, we step the facilitators go back again and reinforce the message and ensure that they do the right thing. And we do this before you even get a grant so that you are given enough information to be able to function well as um, somebody who wants to engage in um, productive inclusion. Thank you so much, um, Desmond. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, uh, so um, we would like to now uh, take a moment uh, to ask you to respond to the, the, the Zoom poll that um, now shows up on the screen. I was asked to read this out uh, for the interpreters to be able to interpret. 
uh, the question is, um, would you use ideas and materials from this session for your future work uh, in this area? Uh, strongly agree, agree, uh, nor agree or disagree, disagree and strongly agree. Uh, so a uh, majority of the responses are strongly agree and, uh, and agree. Uh, which is great, which shows, I guess, the, the relevance of, um, of this session for, for the audience. Um, so the second question is, would you recommend this series of uh, webinars to your um, colleagues? And again, a majority of the responses are uh, strongly agree um, and, uh, and agree. Um, and um okay i think that's about it uh thank you so much for uh for responding to um those those questions and uh thanks again everyone this was a great session um we learned a lot about the experience um uh on how economic inclusion programs can actually help the poor and vulnerable uh, to save each of our panelists shared with us their valuable and unique experiences and this topic is so important that we need to continue to build the evidence space in this space and and continue to learn from experiences bearing in mind uh that uh, as as uh, video was saying uh context matters um, and before closing, I'd like to thank once again our panelists, the organizing team, and also our interpreters who work uh, very hard in the in the background. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to close this session and looking forward to seeing you in the next webinar in November. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Mary.